Oh, hi there. Thanks for showing up for your learning. Uh, welcome to lesson 2.5, solving quadratics by factoring. So if this is something you already know how to do, keep your uh, side conversations a little quiet so that the others who don't know how to do this yet can learn. Let's review very quickly the factored form of a quadratic. This is a, a form that shows us the roots. Another word for roots are the zeros or the x-intercepts of a quadratic. So if I show you f of x is equal to a multiplied by x minus r times x minus s, what are the roots of this general factored quadratic here? Well, the roots are given by r and s. So here's r, here's s. So the roots would be r, 0, and s, 0. Okay. The zeros come from the fact that they're x-intercepts. The value of y all along the x-axis is 0. The x-axis is effectively the line y equals 0. That's all the places where the output is 0. Okay. So now we can use that knowledge to graph g of x here. Let's do g of x in another color because I've done a lot of underlining and that already. So the first thing that we're going to notice, where are the roots for g of x? Well, they're going to have zeros for y. But what are the x values of the roots? Sorry? Negative 1 and 3? I agree. Negative 1 and 3. Notice that we had to flip the signs here to get those roots. And we're going to be doing a lot of that sign flipping today in the brackets. Can anyone explain why we have to flip those signs? And one explanation is, well, it's negative inside the formula or inside the form there. So I know to flip the signs whenever I see that negative. But algebraically, why would the numbers x is negative 1 or the numbers x equals 3 make that quadratic equal 0? So let's take a look at what happens if I evaluate one of these roots. Let's try g at, you pick one, negative 1 or 3? Three? 3. So let's try g at 3. This is a set of instructions saying substitute 3 in wherever you see x. So I'll have negative 3 plus 1 multiplied by 3 minus 3. And now let's evaluate. The value of g at 3, the function at the x value 3, is equal to negative 3 plus 1 is 4. So negative 4 multiplied by 3 minus 3 is 0. What's the value of negative 4 times 0? 0. So it's equal to 0. So that creates the point uh, 3, 0, this point. There. When x is 3, y is 0. Notice that it's just the, the flipped sign of whatever is in the bracket with x. Because the flipped sign is going to add together to be 0. And then you've got a situation where one of your multiplication factors is 0. Anything multiplied by 0 is 0. So if there's briefcases out there with a million dollars each, but you've got 0 of those briefcases, you got 0 dollars. If I add money to each one of those briefcases, but you still have zero briefcases, you still got zero dollars, I'm afraid. Doesn't matter. Same situation if you've got 15 briefcases, but they all got zero dollars in them, you still got zero dollars, right? If either one of your factors is zero, you got, still got zero. So multiplication, if any of your factors are zero, the answer is zero. So that's why we need to flip these signs. So we've got two roots. Let's put them in. Here, boop. I'm going to call that the point negative 1. And then I go over, well, that'd be like 1, 2, here, boop, that's, the, that's 3. So now I've got my two roots. And then I can say, well, where's the vertex of this uh, function going to be? And it turns out that it's right in between them. Here's the axis of symmetry at x equals 1. I know that x is 1 is one of the axis of symmetry because that's the average of negative 1 and 3. So the midpoint between the two roots is going to give me the vertex. 
So let's find what's g at, g at 1 so that I can uh, solve for it. So g at 1 is negative 1 plus 1 multiplied by 1 minus 3. Okay, I'm just substituting in there. I had planned on doing the substitution underneath here, but uh, y'all wanted to see me evaluate a root, so here we go. So I had to copy out the function. Now let's keep going. g at 1 is equal to negative 2 times negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 2 gives me positive 4. Negative 2 times negative 2, positive 4. So the, uh, the vertex is up here at, that looks like about the point 1, 4 to me. So we'll put that one on. Now we've got four, three points through which to draw our parabola. And we can draw a beautiful parabola this way. And this way. And that's what this uh, parabola looks like. So graphing from factored form is, this would be my process to graph from factored form. Plot the roots. They're given by the form. And then average the roots, find the, the x value of the vertex, and then evaluate the function at that point to find the, the y value of the vertex. Plot it and put your parabola through. Done. If you want to get fancy, you can use your step pattern. You can put on more points. But really, already, I've got a really good picture of what's going on with, the, with this stuff. So now, we get to the new stuff. Let's say we want to know the zeros of a quadratic that's in standard or vertex form. We can find those by factoring. Let's make me smaller. Maybe the people at home want to see me, so they, I don't know. I don't know why they would want that. Put me way in the corner. All right. So we can find these zeros by factoring. Let's say we had an f of x, some function, and we want to know when that f of x is equal to zero. Here is f of x, 2x squared minus 3x minus 2. And I'm telling you, we can find the points where this function is equal to zero by factoring this. So how do we factor something that looks kind of challenging like that? 2x squared minus 3x minus 2. Well, if you don't remember how to factor these, here is why I put it in. Here's some review. We're going to play a special x game. We're going to take a, this number, and multiply it by c. And put that number on the top of our x game. So 2 times minus 2 is minus 4. And then we're going to take b here and put it on the bottom, minus 3. So these two multiply and go up there. This one just goes down there. Hi, Noah. Uh, the late one? Oh, yeah, there it is up there. Cool. Okay. So now we want to multiply to negative 4 and add to negative 3. Well, what two numbers do that? Multiplies to negative 4. Oh, uh, multiply to negative 4. 4 and 1. And which one's negative if they add together to minus 3? Yeah, minus 4 and positive 1 are, are our numbers. These numbers multiply to negative 4 and add to negative 3. Now, we've found these two special numbers, and we can rewrite this quadratic. 0 is equal to still 2x squared, but I'm going to use another color to show you what I do with these two numbers here, and I'll circle them in blue here. These are significant numbers, so I'm circling them many times. So this minus 3x can come down and become instead minus 4x plus 1x. That's the same thing you'll notice as minus 3x, but I wrote it with two different numbers instead. And then still minus 2. This minus 2 comes down itself. 2x squared still comes down. So this is called decomposing the middle term. Now we common factor this bit. And we common factor this bit. So let's take a look at what we get. Our first bit I'll do in orange. 0 is equal to the co bit greatest common factor between 2x squared and 4x is 2x. The largest number factor is 2. And the largest number of x's I can take out is one of them, 1x. 
So this will factor as 2x multiplied by x minus 2. And then over here, the blue one, well, it can factor as well, but the greatest common factor is just 1. So actually here it's useful to write this one common factor and then x minus 2 in there. So I've factored these by grouping, and then I see that I have a greatest common binomial factor that appears here and here. The same factor appears twice. That factor can be factored out of both of those terms, the two terms that are connected by this addition. So let's go ahead and do that. Now we will have 0 is equal to uh, x minus 2 multiplied by 2x plus 1. This is now factored fully. And if I know that 0 is equal to some number minus 2 multiplied by some number times 2 plus 1, I can now find the two possible values of that x. There's two possibilities. And the two possibilities come from one from each factor. Okay? So if I know that this is equal to 0, then either x minus 2 equals 0 or 2x plus 1 equals 0. One of those two things has to be true. Because there's no other way to multiply and get 0 besides having 0 as one of your factors. Let's go back to the briefcases full of cash. You've got a non-zero number of them. Maybe you have one. Maybe you have three briefcases. If there's a non-zero amount of money in every briefcase, then by definition, you have some money. Because you've got briefcases, and each briefcase has some money in it. One of those two things has to be zero for you to have zero money. You either need zero briefcases, or each briefcase needs to have zero dollars, or else you've got some money. It's good news, right? Probably I don't see any briefcases in this class, so we're all learning math so that we can make that money. Is that right? We're going to make that money in the future with these skills. Uh, these are the skills that will pay the bills, people. Okay, so if x minus 2 equals 0, then what does x equal in this case? Yeah, x equals 2. We would get that by adding 2 to both sides. Okay? If 2 times x plus 1 equals 0, can you do that one in your head? one is harder this one here if x minus 2 equals 0 then that means x is equal to 2 or this equation is true 2x plus 1 equals 0 yeah negative 0 0.05 or negative 1 half good yeah so the way you do these is just use your uh, inverse operations so then we know that 2x is equal to negative 1 subtract 1 from both sides and then divide both sides by 2 to get x equals negative one half negative 0 0.5 perfect that's fine too okay so this is how you solve a quadratic by factoring this only applies when the quadratic is equal to zero because you're looking for those roots you're looking for the times when y is equal to zero the output of the function is equal to zero and so we're solving for x intercepts in these cases okay Let's do another example. And it's this example up here. 0 is equal to negative 3, x minus 2 squared plus 12. What kind of form is that in? What kind of quadratic is that? Negative 3 times x minus 2 squared plus 12. Is that standard vertex or factored form? This is a vertex form parabola. Good. It has its vertex where? It's actually at positive 2 and 12. Yeah. yeah, because that one that's inside the bracket with x yeah. is also a sign flipper. Good, yeah. So um, this has a vertex at 2, 12. Let's sketch it over here because uh, we don't really have room to sketch it there. And then we can use our sketch to make predictions about what the answer ought to be when we finally get to an answer. Eraser. Erase the quadratic formula. Sketch the parabola. Okay, so 
Here is our x-axis, our y-axis. We know it has a vertex at 2, 12. That's the point 2, 12. If we have this function g of x is equal to negative 3 x minus 2 squared plus 12, this number, flip the sign, and that number give you these points for the vertex form. And then we get the stretch factor there. We know it's opening downwards, and it's pretty stretched. So the step pattern, we could use step pattern here. Instead of being 1, 3, 5, dot, 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 the step pattern is going to be 3, 9, 15, but they're all negative. Just multiply the step pattern by the A value, negative 3. So actually by doing this, we can solve for the roots here really good using these steps, eh? Notice there, that's how I built this one. Right? There's my negative 12. So my first step is going to go down 3 and over 1. So this is the point of 1, 9, and 3, 9, just by step pattern, right? And the next one is going to go down by 9. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, there's one. It's right at the root, right at the origin. Sorry, that's the point zero zero. And then the other one will be over at uh, 4, 4, 0. And then we can draw our quadratic. I said we were going to do a quick sketch, but it turns out we got a very accurate picture of this, and we actually solved the problem. Cool, right? Pretty cool. OK, now let's do the algebra. All right, if I want to solve this one for x, I could table of values and find values of x here that will make that 0, but it's much easier to turn it into standard form and then factor it rather than doing trial and error. So to turn this into standard form, let's do this in purple in honor of our purple work on the board. So we're going to have 0 is equal to negative 3 times x minus 2 squared plus, oh, sorry, x minus 2 times x minus 2. This is how you square a binomial. You write it out, plus 12. And now let's FOIL it. 0 is equal to negative 3 times x times x, which is x squared. x times negative 2, which is negative 2x. Negative 2 times x, which is negative 2x. And negative 2 times negative 2, which is plus 4. Plus 12. The plus 12 is just going to hang out there. And then... Collect your like terms, so 0 is equal to negative 3 times x squared minus 4x plus 4 plus 12. 0 is equal to, now let's expand this minus 3 in. We're going to do the multiplication next before we do this addition. So minus 3 times x squared minus 3 times minus 4 and minus 3 times 4. So we'd have minus 3x squared um, minus 12x minus 12 plus 12. Ah, oh, those 12s are going to cancel out and become nothing. Last thing we do is that addition. Negative 3x squared minus 12x. Okay, so we expanded our vertex form parabola. We now have it in standard form. And we found that c was 0. So when c is 0 in the standard form, we know that it crosses the y-axis at 0. And so that was actually one of the roots. Cool, right? So it gave, gives us this point. But by factoring, we'll find this other one. And we'll also see this one still when we factor it. So we want to factor minus 3x squared minus 12x. What's our greatest common factor here for... Minus 3x squared minus 12x. It doesn't factor like a trinomial because this one's actually a binomial. There's only two terms. So we're not going to end up with two brackets here. But we can common factor it. What's our biggest common factor that we'd want to pull out here? What flavor of 3 would you take out, Kate? Yeah, I would take out 3x, but I would also, you like vanilla, I like chocolate. I like the opposite flavor. Take out the negative 3x. Sorry? Oh, it's my, it's my uh, gentle way of saying, is that positive or negative? When I say, like, what flavor of 3? Yeah, because there's two flavors. 
Okay, so zero is equal to negative three X is our biggest common factor. Multiplied by X plus, sorry, X. I made a mistake, I made a sign error, ha 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 ha. Negative three times negative four X is positive 12 X. Negative three, this is positive 12 X here. So this will be, erase that, minus four. All right. Notice that it was my visualization that saved me there from making a mistake. Because I have this visualized, I knew that that was wrong. Okay, so now, if this is equal to zero, then either negative three X must be zero. If negative three X equals zero, then we divide both sides by negative three, X equals zero, okay? And that was this point that we found here. Or, X minus four equals zero. That means X equals, add four to both sides, four. And there's our two solutions. And there's the other one, four, zero. Okay? So that's how these will crumble to you when you apply factoring to solve for these zeros. Here we found it graphically, but it won't always be that easy. Now, these types of situations, they show up a lot in application type questions. Do I need to hang out more on that page so you can copy down the solution or? No, keep going, keep going. And here is my four step solution to conquering application questions that ask you for, to solve for different quadratics. First, always draw a picture of the situation as best you can. Drawing it on the XY plane is even a bonus. That's even better, okay? And then you can choose to do things like make zero, zero one of your points. It will give you easier quadratics, stuff like that. Or if it's being thrown from some place, well, it's probably being thrown from the Y axis, maybe up high or something. Mara? Sure, go ahead. Next thing is label all the points you can, label your equations and put all your data onto your picture. Then use, then start using algebra. Then start your factoring. Then start solving for the different X values. Then once you've gotten the different X values, you interpret them through your picture. And that way you're always starting in reality, going to the fancy world of math and bringing back the treasure you found and relating it to reality. So if we have a ball kicked in the air and it follows this parabola, where, is, where H is height in meters and X is horizontal distance, we want to know how far this ball goes, okay? So let's draw a picture. I'm going to use green to draw the X axis because that reminds me of grass. So there, and I am going to say, well, I notice that this is a quadratic in standard form and it has a C value of zero. So this actually goes through this point here, zero, zero. So I know zero, zero is one of the roots. All right. And I see that it's a parabola that opens downwards and that it's crossing the Y axis with some slope. So it looks something like this. Because it opens downwards, it's going to come down. And this also matches what I learned about balls when I was uh, maybe, you know, eight months or, or one year. You know, we've seen things go up and come down all our lives. So this is just math matching our reality when we see this type of thing. And that should feel like a click. Uh, it shouldn't feel like this math is something that we do only off in the space of math to get numbers that are meaningless. They are, they're connected to reality right? at the end of the day. We're using these for reality. And we want to know this distance. This is the question, right? That's the question. How far does negative one over 10 X squared plus two X go when this is height H and this is X horizontal distance. Emily? Can you explain how I knew that it was this shape? Yeah. So this number A tells me, because it's negative, it tells me it's a parabola opening downwards. And so that was what I used there. Mm -hmm. When I saw that C was zero, that's my Y intercept. And it doesn't show up there. I'm 42 plus zero years old. I don't write that. 
I don't say that usually. I actually say that way way more often than you would than you. You've heard me say that before. But you don't see those zeros, is what I'm saying. But it's there. It's plus zero. So C is zero. That means the y-intercept is zero. So I knew that it was kicked from the origin. And that's a common math trick to make the math look simpler. So that's why I set it up this way. Okay? And then um, the two there tells me that as x is getting bigger right by the y-axis, y is getting bigger too. But pretty soon, the, the, as x increases, this term, its power gets bigger and bigger, the bigger x gets. That's why it turns and goes down. And it turns out that gravity works exactly in that way. It's exactly modeled by stuff like this. And so that's, that's how the math lines up. And that's how I draw that shape. Okay? I don't have any more details than that until I do the algebra. But once I do the algebra, I'll be able to find this point, which is like S0. It's one of the roots. I don't know S yet. But once I do, I'll know how far the ball went. So let's find out. So now I've done steps one and two. I've drawn a picture and I've labeled the picture with everything that I can so far. I'm also aware that right now I don't care about how high the ball went, but I could find it if I found the vertex here. But I don't care. I just want to know how far it went. So let's find out. H of X is equal to negative one over 10 X squared plus two X. Now what I'm going to do here is I am going to factor this by taking out negative one-tenth x from both terms. So I am going to basically be multiplying by negative one over 10 x and dividing by negative one over 10 x to common factor out that negative one-tenth. This will create this new parabola. It will look like this, this new equation. Okay. This will be equal to negative 1 over 10x. That's this one here. Okay. It's going to come in front. <laughs> negative 1 over 10x squared divided by x. That's just x. 2 divided by, well, x divided by x there is going to give me a linear term. And 2 divided by negative 1 tenth. Well, let's do our rough work. 2 divided by negative 1 over 10 is equal to flip the fraction that you're dividing by and multiply. 2 times negative 10. Okay? So this will be minus 20. And now I can see the roots. It's right there. Okay, so this will be zero, okay? This equation will be zero, meaning it has a height of zero, meaning it's on the x-axis at two places. One of them is when x is zero, or another one is when x is 20. So then I know that x is equal to zero, or x is equal to 20. All right? And then, uh, so I know, therefore, the ball travels 20 meters. Done. That kind of makes sense, right? You kick a ball, it goes 20 meters. It's a good kick. Huh? It's a little janky, isn't it? As I go through that, I feel like I'm losing some people. So I want to show another way to solve this one. Yeah, it's, uh, let's say I have it here. Negative 1 over 10 x squared plus 2x. And I don't want to factor this out because I'm a little scared of it. So I have this as height as a function of horizontal distance. So then I'm just going to have height as a function of horizontal distance. And I'm interested in when that equals zero. And I'm going to only factor out my x. Then I will have negative 1 over 10x plus 2 inside the bracket still. All I've done is factored out an x. I still get either x is zero or 
negative 1 over 10 multiplied by x plus 2 equals 0. And that's harder to solve, but it's still solvable. Let's solve it. So uh, uh, subtract 2 from both sides. Negative 1 over 10x equals negative 2. And then multiply both sides by negative 10. If I multiply negative a tenth by negative 10, multiply both sides by negative 10, this here is just 1. Negative 10 divided by negative 10 is 1. So this gives me x is equal to 20. And maybe you'll like this method better. And if you like this method better, I don't blame you. Do that method. I'll do the other method every day because I love me some algebra. Well, this is a little bit less like weird algebra. Do you agree, Will? That makes a little bit more sense? Okay, we'll do it that way. That's great. Okay, one more application question. This one I actually just took out of the textbook. So this one, hi Sydney. You will have an example of this in the textbook. You can look at the textbook situation and we can solve this one together as well. This time we're not doing height as a function of vertical distance. We're doing height as a function of time. And with these ones, you'll often see a negative five as your A value. And that's how they've done it here. Actually, negative 4.9 is even more accurate, but we keep the numbers simple for you so that it can come out with a nice common factor. Okay? In physics, that's uh, uh, 9.8 meters per second per second, which is the acceleration of gravity. You divide that by two when you're putting it into quadratic equations for reasons you all understand when you do calculus. But it's actually it's negative 4.9. Here we round to five. Okay, so let's draw our picture. Here is our bridge and it's up high. And I'm going to make the, the edge of the bridge the y-axis. And I'm gonna use blue in honor of the water that the bridge is over. So the level, the water line is gonna be my x-axis. Actually, in this case, it's the t-axis for time. And here, this is height. And that would be the height of uh, 60. I know that it starts at 60 because it's up there. That's its y-intercept. So that's the point uh, 0 in the x, or 0 in the t, sorry, at 0 seconds. It's at 60 meters high. It's a parabola that opens downwards and it's rising when it starts. So it looks something like this. And I want to find what time is it when it hits the ground? Because if I find what time is it when it hits the ground, I'll know how long it was in the air. So what's the value of time when height is zero? Okay, so let's find that. So we're going to start with h of t. Now we're ready to do our algebra. H of t, and I don't think you're ready to do algebra until you have a good visualization. Because without a good visualization, you're just plugging numbers in at random and trying to find a random number and kind of begging and hoping that it's the right answer when you find it. But you want to know what you're looking for and why. So h of t is equal to minus 5t squared plus 5t plus 60. What's your first step for factoring something looks like that? Hi, Dave. We're interested in the situation where height is zero. We want to know what time creates a zero height. So put that in here. Zero is equal to, and let's factor out a minus five. We see that five is common to everything. So let's take minus five out to get t squared minus t minus 60 divided by 5 minus 12. Okay. People comfortable with that common factoring that I just did there? And do you see why I took out minus 5 instead of 5? If I take out minus 5, then this is going to be a positive 1 there, and that's much easier to factor. And then... I just divide this by negative 5, I get negative t, negative 1t, and I divide this by negative 5, and I get negative 12. So that's how I factor that one. And then we go ahead and we have minus 5 multiplied by, I want to win this x game. 
minus 12 multiplies to minus 12 adds to minus 1. What are those numbers? Two numbers, they multiply to minus 12, they add to minus 1. I can go 12 here and say 12 is 2 times 6 is 2 times 3, right? And now I know that I also have a negative 1 that I can play with because I'm interested in negative 12. So here are my factors, and I got four factors, and I can group them in different ways. Let's try... Uh, 2 times 2 times 3, which is 12, multiplied by negative 1. It multiplies to negative 12, but it adds to 11. That's much too big. So let's try something a little different. Let's put uh, 2 times 2, okay, that's 4, and then 3 times negative 1. So I'm just grouping these factors in different ways. So 4 times negative 3 multiplies to 12, negative 12, but it adds to 1. I want it to add to negative 1. So when I try, I'm very close to the answer. I just try the other way. Negative 4 times positive 3. And so I just play around with those factors. And yes, I see factor trees in my head. Yes, you can write down a factor tree on your paper if you don't see them in your head yet. So this is minus 4 and 3. So that means t is minus 4 and t is plus 3. So in this case, what's the value of this root here? Are there two answers? We've been seeing a lot of two answer things before. What are the two answers here? Yeah, but wait for this piece of information and then I go, this is the very end of the lesson. It looks like I can have this whole thing equaling zero, right? Like it has a height of zero all along here, either when t has two different values. What are the two values of t that would make a zero here? Can I make this equal to zero with some value of t? Yeah? What value of t would make this, this one zero? Bennett, you just said it. Yes? Yeah, Zach Aston Reese and all those guys. Yeah, four. Four is the answer. And then over here, what value of t would make that zero? Negative three. What does that mean? Negative three seconds. Remember, t is time. Is that something that makes sense in this situation? That's the root that exists back here. Okay. That would be negative three back there. It's nonsense in this case. It was before the rock was thrown. You know what I mean? So the answer here is, therefore, the rock is in the air for four seconds. And you will often get situations where the math tells you two answers and one of them is nonsense. You'll only know that it's nonsense if you have a good understanding of the situation, if you have that picture either in your mind or on your work. Okay? So this is how we solve quadratics that are equal to zero, everyone. Hit me up with your questions by email or bring me over while you're doing your practice problems. Bye.